Well, joining me today is Professor Mark Peterson as our special guest, and he recently accepted a position on the board at Tejong Cultural Society, but he is better known as an influencer of all things Korean. He has more than 100,000 followers on YouTube, and some of you might recognize his YouTube channel, The Frog Outside the Well. Hi there, Professor Peterson. So Hi, glad Susanna. to finally meet you. Yes, it's nice to it's nice to see you. Uh, I've been looking forward to this, and this, of course, is the annual great fundraiser and uh, 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 meeting for the uh, Sejong Cultural Society. And I'm just really honored to be on the board. I've worked with them off and on for different seminars for the last oh five or six years, but now to be on the board is even uh, better. You know what I really like about it is working with Lucy Pak. Lucy is She's a phenomenal woman. Mm -hmm. She's off the charts. She's off the charts. And she does such wonderful work with the Sejong Cultural Society. And the board uh, really backs her up and gives her new ideas and uh, does this kind of fundraiser. So I hope this fundraiser is really successful and that a lot of people will chip in and help us to do our program for the coming year. Yeah, what an awesome privilege for us to be participating in this fundraiser because Sejong does so much in terms of forwarding and advancing Korean heritage um, across really North America. And now, frankly, with uh, this digital world across the world, right? Um, I am so interested in just your background, Professor Peterson. And I know you piqued so much interest from uh, the family here at Sejong because not only of your profession um, and your professional background, but also this, this phenomenal YouTube channel. I'm curious. Um, what inspired that name, The Frog Outside the Well? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, the the old saying in Korean is from Chinese, and they use it in Japanese too, is if you criticize someone for having a narrow perspective, you say, you're like the frog in the well. And so I mm. thought about, I'm looking at uh, Korea differently, and I'd like Koreans to open up and look at their history in a more... Uh, positive way. And so I thought, well, yeah, I'm like the frog outside the well. And that's a little bit snobbish, but nobody takes it that way. Nobody, I thought people might, might be offended. They, oh, we're the in the well and you're outside the well. But people take it in a very friendly way, like I'm the foreigner, which is what I am. And I'm saying, hey, Korea, look at these things a little bit differently. Yeah, you lived in Korea, right? You can speak Korean. Hanguk <laughs> my <laughs> That's my uh, Korean right there. <laughs> you also adopted two Korean girls, taught Korean history at BYU. So what sparked your interest in Korean culture? Take us back. Well, it, start, it started when I was in the Army, but not in Korea. Uh, I was in the National Guard in Baltimore, and I met a guy okay. who'd done a missionary work in Korea. And he told me about it. It sounded so fascinating. So I applied and I was a missionary in Korea for two and a half years. And then I went back as a student. Then I took my wife back and studied for my PhD. And then I got a job. I was the director of the Fulbright program for seven years. And that was a lot of wow. fun. And then I got my job at BYU teaching. And uh, in the meantime, I traveled to Korea a lot before the COVID uh, 2019, I had eight trips in one year. It was amazing. So you speak in Korean when you give those lectures? Uh, most of the lectures are in Korean. Some are in English. Most are in Korean. Yeah. And so, you know, what about Korean culture attracts you, and in your opinion, really non-Koreans? Like, what, what about it that has kind of brought you back so many times to uh, to Korea, and then, you know, really kind of broadened your interest in, like you said, the history and, um, you know, various things like even social media. There are two primary things that caught my interest in the first place. One was the Korean family system. The Korean family seems so strong and so tight and such strong mm -hmm. bonds between uh, parent and child. And then the second thing was education. Korea has an extraordinary uh, interest in getting their children educated, uh, perhaps more than any other country in the world. And it goes back to the old Kwagochedo of taking the exams to get a government position. 
And uh, today too, students are just crazy in cramming for the exam. And so uh, the educational system of Korea really fascinated me. It's a little bit overboard, frankly, it's a little <laughs> bit overboard, but still the way they uh, consider education so important. You know, Korea is called the economic miracle. But my old friend, Horace Underwood, who was the grandson of the founder of Yonsei University, he used to say, the education miracle preceded the economic miracle. So that's been uh, the two driving forces to understand why and how the family operates and then why and how this drive for education operates. Those are the things that got me started. Yeah, I actually, as a former journalist, I traveled to South Korea uh, as a, a fellow. And one of, the, one of the things that caught my attention was when a diplomat said that Korea is the only country in the world to date that was ever a, a developing country, a third world country that now has become a donor country. So we came out of poverty and now we are donating to developing countries. Well, that's a... Well, that's another thing I saw. When I first went to Korea in 1965, the development after the war was still very, very slow. Per capita income in Korea that year was $125 per person per year. Just absolute grinding poverty. And yet the people had such uh, optimism and such hope for the future. It was just inspiring. And I knew at that time in 1965, that in 2021, <laughs> Kangnam would look like Kangnam, <laughs> that, that Korea would develop the way they've developed. Oh, wow. Yeah, I, I visited Kangnam and you almost feel like you're in, you know, like New York or Chicago. It's just a thriving area of, of Seoul. Well, well, Kangnam is either is nicer than New York. Kangnam is nicer than Park <laughs> Avenue or Fifth Avenue. Yeah, uh, it's newer, it's shinier, it's brighter, mm -hmm. uh, and it's more upbeat. So uh, Korea has really come a long way from one of the poorest countries in the world to really one of the richest countries. It's rated number twelve or number ten, depending on how you how you count it. So it's just uh, marvelous. It's just marvelous what Korea has done. For those of you who have just come across Taejong Cultural Society, uh, I just want to give a little background, and you can fill in the gaps as well, Professor Peterson. Uh, but it was formed back in 2003 by the Seoul National University Alumni Association. It's headquartered in a suburb of Chicago, and it's intended to, as I mentioned earlier uh, in the segment, to advance awareness and understanding of Korea's cultural heritage through contemporary creative and fine arts. And really, the organization is known to provide numerous writing and music programs, uh, but more specifically, Taejong hosts a Shijo competition as well as a music competition every every year. Uh, Mark, what can you tell us about Shijo and you know why that's gaining so much interest? Shijo has really captured my interest, and that's what brought me to the Sejong Cultural Society is their Shijo contest. And I just really think that's a wonderful thing. And it has grown and grown. And as I was teaching uh, uh, Korean literature in my classes, I would very often, uh, when we got to Shijo, I would ask students if they knew haiku. All mm. American students know haiku. They've written haiku. When I first started teaching at the university, I'd ask about haiku and students had studied it in high school. Later, I found they were studying it in junior high. Later, now more recently, uh, students study haiku in third or fourth grade. And they not only study haiku, they just don't look at the masters that were written years ago. They write haiku. It's a creative exercise. And so, <laughs> you know, in Korea, there's this saying, about your cousin bought some land and I got a stomach ache. My cousin bought some <laughs> land and I got a stomach ache. I was so jealous. I'm jealous of haiku. I hate to admit it, but I would like to see Shijo become as popular and as pervasive in all aspects of Korean, of American society as haiku. And because haiku has become that successful, there's no reason in the world why Shijo cannot as well. And we're starting to get there. Shijo is starting to spread around the United States. And a lot of you, that expansion has to do with Shijo and Cultural Society. I, I, I hear that Wisconsin held a state Shijo contest 
that the Sejong and Cultural Society helped with. How has uh, this organization been kind of that impetus and that that um, that aid to bring awareness of Shijo across the country? Yes. Yeah, Sejong has done the most important work in spreading the word about Shijo. And uh, it spread to Wisconsin because we have a very good teacher of Shijo whose students win first, second, third, or honorable mention every year in Wisconsin. And she's been a driving force to have the Shijo, Constant, uh, Shijo contest in Wisconsin. But we've also had a contest in LA uh, with the LA Cultural Society. We've had one in Ohio at Ohio State University. And I'm trying to get one started here in Utah with cooperation with the Utah uh, uh, Educational uh, Organization. So, uh, yeah, it's starting to spread. And it all started with Sejong, with the Sejong Cultural Society. Yeah, and we're still in 2006. Non-Koreans comprised of just 25% of participants. But this year, non-Koreans comprised 97%. That is a huge jump. Yes, Yes, this Shijo contest, I think when the, cult, the Sejong Cultural Society envisioned Shijo, they saw it as a, an event for Korean American students. But it quickly has spread to become not just Korean American students, but 97% ordinary Americans. And the winners each year, uh, they have names like Smith, Johnson, Rodriguez, <laughs> and, and Chong. <laughs> There uh, and Chow, uh, some Chinese Americans have been winning the contest recently. That is awesome. Let's go ahead and hear from this year's Shijo winner. Yes. Here's my Shijo. Downsizing. That sweater, so warm and soft, yet full of holes, hangs unworn. Let's toss it. Downsizing means tough decisions. No one wears it. Wait, I cry. Grandma made that when I was young. It still fits. Well, that was beautiful, Professor Peterson. What'd you think of it? I know you, you've probably heard so many and you, you helped judge, but what'd you think about this year's winner? I was the judge for this year, for, for this one, and I really enjoyed that. I thought, uh, I, I thought it really captured uh, sentiment. And to me, the thing about Shijo is it has to capture an emotion or it just doesn't work. And the emotion could be humor. Uh, there's a great Shijo in the Wisconsin contest about uh, consider the frog, be contemplative. I, I should read it off, but he says, consider the frog, be contemplative and, and uh, restful, and then catch the fly, but then feel free to spit out the fly. <laughs> so it's had this humor to it. <laughs> But um, uh, the one by Alice Davidson uh, that we just listened to, uh, the, the warmth of that sweater, and let's throw it out, we have to downsize, but no, it still fits. And I asked uh, uh, Alice if, uh, if there really is a sweater, and she said, no, it's all in her imagination. <laughs> <laughs> but it seems so real. And we all have that kind of feeling. We have to throw out things, but no, don't throw that out. It still fits. Grandmother made it for me. Ah, it's just a wonderful sentiment. Petron offers other contests and programs. We'll hear uh, from the musicians in a bit. But I do want to hear more about your take, uh, Professor Peterson, on how the world has embraced Korean music, dramas, and culture. Uh, from BTS to, you know, barbecue. Uh, almost every city, major city now has Korean barbecue. Uh, so I'm curious, you know, with your decades of Korean interest studies, uh, what surprises you the most about this, this specific and sudden kind of draw to all things Korean? You, you know, I'd like to sit back and say, I saw it all coming and, and I'm not surprised, but that's not true. I am surprised. I am really surprised by BTS. Um, several years ago, our enrollments at the university started to grow in uh, Korean enrollments. It used to be our 101 class. We had to beg the administration to hold the class because we needed 20 students and we only had 12, we only had 10, but we'd beg and the administration would say, oh, okay, you need it to get started. 
But now, uh, well, gradually back then we had two sections. We had 40 students. Then we had 60 students. Then we had 80 students. Now we've got 120 students in the first year class. So we got five or six sections of 101. What's made the difference? It's been K-pop. Uh, Korean or American kids watching uh, K-pop music, watching K-pop drama, crash landing on you, <laughs> watching K-pop <Yeah>. movies. <laughs> And that these kids want to learn Korean. And it's just amazing. So when I first saw this happening, I thought, I've got to look into K-pop. So I looked at uh, the, the music and the popular uh, t uh, uh, group then was Sonyo Shide, the um, SN, Sonyo Shide, uh, SNSD, uh, these uh, young women stingers. And I watched a couple of them. I just fell in love with them. They're, it was so attractive and it was moving and it was good music it was really interesting and so i thought no oh, this this is not temporary this is not some passing fad this thing's going to hold on and now uh sonia shide is is still out there but uh, black pink has become very very popular and then of course bts is just off the charts they've played on every american uh late night show and uh, they're very, very popular. So it's uh, it's an amazing thing to see. Uh, Zupas, the, <laughs> the food chain, uh, recently has a pulgogi uh, sandwich. <laughs> and so <laughs> it's it's going everywhere, as as you mentioned. Yes. Yeah, that is something else. Um, everyone knows about BTS. It used to be, you know, some of those K-pop bands or groups you know, people who are interested in, in K-pop would know of them, but now it's, it's, it's mainstream. I mean, yeah. if you don't know a BTS song, then like, where have you been? <laughs> when you were a little girl, uh, Korea was not cool. And people didn't have a good impression of Korea. MASH was the TV show, of poor war-torn country that went from that, that image in a matter of like 30 years to becoming really cool. I mean, Korean is so cool these days and people want to go to Korea. People want Korean food. They like Korean music. They love Korean movies. And Parasite got the Academy Award for the best picture of the year. Unbelievable. Yeah. All of that, um, all of that, there's a foundation to it. And that's what that's, to me, that's the beauty of Tejo and Cultural Society because uh, it's all about educating people. Like, where did that come from? What are the roots? What's the history? Yeah. So, Again, for those of you who are watching, who are listening, uh, you know, the, the society, the cultural society needs donations in order to keep running, right? I really love the Korea, uh, the uh, Sejong Cultural Society. I've done a lot of work with the Korea Society in New York. And they do, uh, they used to do a lot of education. That's when I was involved. Then they got a new director and he shifted toward politics and economics. And there are lots of ways to study a culture and to study a country. And the, the Korea Society has gone economics and uh, uh, politics and not much education, not much culture. The Sejong Cultural Society is not doing politics. It's not doing economics. It's not doing economic development. It's doing culture pure culture. And uh, it's doing a great job. So I hope our listeners will uh, uh, help us out and help us fill our budget. Uh, the bigger budget we have, the better work we can do. So uh, uh, chip in and let's uh, let's make Sejong Cultural Society even more prosperous than it has been in the past. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Professor Mark Peterson. Thank you for your time. And of course, your contribution to Sejong Cultural Society. Thank you, Susanna. Thank you, Susanna. It's really been a pleasure talking with you.